Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Miller. I am one of the co-chairs of the United Way Bridges Society. I'm here today to welcome our Bridges Society members and those eligible to become members through our Step Up program to our Good Point with Dr. Kenyon Bonner. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing him and giving some of his background. Vice Provost for Student Affairs, Dr. Kenyon Bonner plays a pivotal role in helping the University of Pittsburgh achieve one of its fundamental goals, educating the whole student. The areas under his purview in the Division of Student Affairs include student life, residence life, the University Counseling Center, the Office of Pitt Serves, which offers student volunteering opportunities, Parent and Family Resources, Student Health Service, Student Conduct, the Career Center, Campus Recreation, Pitt Arts, which does the various museums, lectures, and concerts for students, cross-cultural and leadership development, and new student programs. During the pandemic, he also chaired the university's COVID-19 compliance team, which met daily to monitor student compliance with health and safety standards and guidelines. He earned his Doctor of Education in Higher Education Management at the University of Pennsylvania, his Master's of Education in Rehabilitation Counseling at Kent State, and his BA in Psychology and Philosophy at Washington and Jefferson. His research interests include Black male student success, retention and graduation, college student mental health, diversity, equity, justice, and inclusion. In his spare time, he likes to spend time with his family, attending his children's basketball and football games, watching Marvel movies, playing video games, and running. He also serves as the co-chair of the United Way Impact Cabinet, and he sits on the board of directors for Southwestern Pennsylvania's chapter of the American Red Cross and Family House Pittsburgh. And somehow he found some time to chat with us today. So I'm very honored to welcome him to our program. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for that introduction. Yeah, I saw you emphasize in his free time, his spare time. So um, that's been difficult to find over the last half year and a half, but I'm happy to make time um, for the United Way Bridges Society. And thank you for the invitation. Um, thank you for organizing the event, particularly Lauren Mitchell, um, all of the members who are here today for your commitment uh, to work with the United Way. And Laura, thank you for moderating uh, this event. So I know I have a little bit of time to talk to you, and then I definitely want to make sure that we have time for, for Q&A. So um, I'll get started. You know, Laura I gave you my bio, and some of you may be wondering what a vice provost for student affairs does. Uh, my 16-year-old daughter um, believes my job is to manage emotions. There, there is a lot of managing emotions in my job, but I would say there's much more to it than that. Um, the beautiful aspects of working in higher education and specifically student affairs are that every day uh, we have an opportunity to impact someone's life. On the individual level, I have the privilege of meeting thousands of young people who, in my opinion, will become our future. And then in some meaningful way, um, I feel like I'm contributing um, to that new future and that world. Uh, my hope in the work that I do, and hopefully um, sharing this with my colleagues, is that we're educating a more informed, enlightened, reasonable, just, caring, and compassionate and peaceful future. Um, there are not many professions in the world that I think allow you to engage with generations of people who live and learn in one community for four plus years, then leave to make meaning of their lives. Uh, every morning I wake up, I feel like I have an opportunity to make a difference. Um, when I step onto Oakland's campus, the first thing I look at um, is the bus lanes because the bus lane on Fifth, Fifth Avenue is pretty dangerous. But I, the second thing I look at is um, the Cathedral of Learning and it just reminds me of why I chose to work in higher education and, and, and how much opportunity we have at the University of Pittsburgh in particular. So today I just wanna cop, you know, touch on maybe three points. The first, I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Who am I? Some of you are like, who is this person? The second, I want to talk about some leadership lessons I've learned throughout my life and career. And then the third thing I want to talk about is just a few words of encouragement um, for folks. So, so who is Kenyon? Um, I'm a husband, father of four children in a blended family. I'm a Cleveland native, born and raised on the east side. So I, I like to disclose that. I'm also a Browns fan. So I know I'm in Pittsburgh, Steeler country, but I'm a Browns fan, die hard. I currently live in the North Hills as one of the few Black families in our community. I mention this because it does matter. Um, as a young child, I, I grew up um, in not the greatest neighborhood. 
I have vivid memories of my mother carrying my little sister in one arm and a shotgun in the other arm as we left the house. That's just a vivid memory that I have. Um, my parents, who always valued education, they illegally enrolled me in a suburban school district in the 70s because they were concerned about the quality of education in the Cleveland public school system. The district went on strike two consecutive years. I remember my mother um, homeschooling us for that period of time. And after that second strike, they had enough and they took a great financial risk and moved us to University Heights, which is a suburb of Cleveland. Um, I have to admit now, although this is who I am now, I fought a lot in elementary school. I got into trouble, mostly because I stood up to bullies. Um, but luckily I matured in middle school. I stopped fighting uh, and I really enjoyed my time in high school. Um, I work in higher education, but I never dreamed of attending college until I was a teenager. It just wasn't something that we talked about. And I kind of fell in love with this idea of college. It was the idea of college through the Cosby Show spinoff, A Different World. Now you might have to Google this, YouTube it, whatever, but A Different World was about the life of students at Hillman College, a fictitious historically black college. And there was a character on A Different World. His name was um, Dwayne Wayne. And he was played by Kadeem Hardison. It was the first time, Dwayne Wayne, the first time I actually saw myself on television, um, other than Theo Huxtable, without a basketball, a football, or baseball or uniform. So, so Bobby, Bobby, <laughs> I, I, you know, old school, that's an that's a old school show. Um, it was the first time I'd seen anyone that I could really identify with. And they were in college. And that's when I realized it's a possibility for me. And that's when I started to just focus some more energy on thinking about life after high school. Um, I did love basketball and I was pretty good. So I used my athletic ability to help pay for college. I figured out that was one way to overcome my parents' inability to, to afford college. I was recruited by several schools, but I decided to attend Washington and Jefferson College. I won't give you the backstory, but you know, W and J, for those of you from Western Southwestern PA, is a small liberal arts, predominantly white institution. Um, at that time, uh, I was the first person in my family um, to go to school in my immediate family. And as far back as I know, I am the first person in my entire family to graduate from a four-year university. This fact, I, I, I mention it because it underscores the deep inequity that exists in our country. Um, it, it shouldn't be the case that I'm the first person that we know about in my family to graduate, but I am, and I'm very proud of that, and people have graduated since, so that there is a, there, there is a, a positive side to that, that bit of information. When I arrived on campus, like a lot of students, I was holding on to beliefs and thoughts I had learned from my young, unexamined life. College was my opportunity to interrogate my personal beliefs. Most of them were benevolent. It was an opportunity to broaden my perspectives, which, which were mostly reasonable, and challenge my prejudices, which were mostly ill-informed. And I'm not quite sure that I would have had a better opportunity to evolve in my thinking and beliefs than during my time in college. And for that, I'm grateful. I was one of approximately 1,200 students, 30 of whom were African-American. My school at the time was neither diverse nor inclusive. There were few Asian American and Pacific Islander students, few Latinx students. I can't recall knowing anyone who was Native American, international, um, and there were very few low income students on my campus. Um, during my first year, I wavered between feeling invisible and feeling like an other. Sometimes I felt like I was an exhibit in an aquarium. I felt stranded and disconnected. Often people would acknowledge my athleticism and membership on the basketball team, completely discounting the fact that, that I was actually a student. And, and this affected me so much at that time that I actually tried to hide that I was a student athlete whenever I could. I love basketball. I enjoy representing our school. I enjoyed my teammates. It's one of my fondest memories of college, but basketball also reinforced a lot of negative stereotypes about being a black man. And despite that incredibly nurturing and supportive um, Black community, I still felt lonely. I still felt isolated at times and frustrated um, more often than I'd like to recall. My experience was incredibly difficult uh, and sometimes depressing. Going to classes, which I was the only person of color, felt like work. 
I was constantly thinking about how I was, how I was representing myself. Am I smiling too much? Do I look angry? Do I look or sound smart in class? Will I be asked to represent everyone who's black? Um, and who will say something insensitive that will force me to take the high road? So I, I learned to put on this metaphoric mask when I went to class or when I was out socially um, and not around my friends. And I, for to be honest, I didn't feel like I belonged for quite some time. And I considered dropping out. It, it wasn't for my roommate, who was also from Cleveland. I would not have returned my sophomore year, but we decided that summer that we would finish together and work through some of those challenges that we had as first year students. But one of the reasons I believe I was successful in college is because I persevered and eventually connected to people and organizations that helped me feel like I mattered. Most importantly, I developed friendships and relationships across races and identities without losing sight of the spaces that allow me to, to let my hair down. I haven't let my hair down in a long time, as you can see, but that was one of the ways that I was able to really persevere through that experience. And as difficult as those, as those experiences were, I also made a profound discovery at a young age. And that was that there are kind, compassionate and caring people in the world who can make a difference in your life. I learned that people matter, relationships matter. So my compassion for people has been the foundation of my leadership philosophy since college. And so I'll talk a little bit about leadership in that, in that regard. So Albert Einstein once said that the leader is one who out of clutter brings simplicity, out of discord, harmony, out of difficulty, opportunity. Frances Hesselbein, former CEO of the Girl Scout, she says to serve is to live. So my first formal leadership position was serving as the president of our Black Student Union at WNJ. This is when my leadership journey began. This is when I began to understand the power of listening to others, seeking to understand the power of acceptance and empathy. I didn't always agree with my peers, but I, I, did, I encouraged dialogue as president. I encouraged collaboration. We compromised. Our collective vision at that time was to create a sense of community for Black students. And we were successful in that regard. So when I was time for me to graduate after all I did in the classroom and basketball, I wanted nothing more than to find a nice paying job. I was tired of being broke. Um, didn't grow up with a lot of money. College was even worse. I was tired of being hungry. I, I said to everyone, I, I just need to get a job so that I can not feel like I don't have money. However, there were professors at WMJ um, and my basketball coach who advised me that I should attend graduate school. I disagreed. I mean, I would argue with them, not argue literally, but I would disagree with them every day about applying for graduate school because I wanted to make money. And I would think, well, it's easy for you to say I should go to graduate school. That's like two to three more years of me being broke. You're doing OK. So they, they just wouldn't take no for an answer. And so after unsuccessful attempts to get me to change my mind, they, they basically colluded with my basketball coach and my, and my parents. And after a basketball game, we gathered in the middle of the court and it was kind of awkward, but I saw my mother and my father walking towards us to the middle of the court. And uh, my mother, you know, the woman who had the shotgun in one arm and my sister in the other, she looked at me and she said, now what's this I hear about you not going to graduate school? And so the rest is history. Um, I, they helped me get into graduate school. I was accepted into a counseling program and I thought I wanted to be a counselor. I soon realized through my experience and my practicum that my clients who were primarily students, they often struggled in college and mostly because of structural issues that could be changed. Um, I thought to myself, why are we thinking about this from the direction of figuring out how to change the student? I didn't see anything quote wrong with our students. I thought we needed to address the issues within their environment, the campus experience, the ecosystem. And so I started asking who was responsible for the student experience or the environment on a college campus. And that's when I learned about student affairs. I applied for a job in residence life as a hall director and I flourished. I loved it. I love working with college students. I love the ability to impact the residential environment. And so that's where I began my career in higher education 25 years ago. So one leadership lesson that I've learned from basketball and my career in higher education 
is the importance of servant leadership. Um, if you're familiar with Robert Greenleaf, he's the author of the 1970 essay, The Servant as Leader. Um, he said, a leader who is servant first makes sure other people's highest priority needs are being served. Do those serve grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit, or at least will they not be further deprived? Another skill that I've developed over the years is emotional intelligence, I think through my own maturity and then watching others. And emotional intelligence is the ability to identify uh, and manage your own emotions, as well as the emotions of others around you. So Robert Greenleaf, again, referred to this as awareness and perception. He said that able leaders are usually sharply awake and reasonably disturbed. They are not seekers after solace. They have their own inner serenity. So over time, I've learned to appreciate my inner serenity when managing conflict and crises and it's been one of the most important aspects of my leadership in a university environment. And I think one of the things that I've observed in others, including my colleagues, that has been a big challenge for them is that emotional maturity. It is something that you can develop, but something you should definitely be mindful of. So in the context of leadership, I wanna talk about another important aspect of leadership and that's inclusive leadership. Now, inclusive leadership means that all team members are treated respectfully and fairly, that everyone on your team feels like they belong to the organization, irrespective of their identities. According to research conducted by Deloitte, the behaviors of leaders, be they senior executives or middle managers, can drive up to 70 percentage points of difference between the proportion of employees who feel highly included and the proportion of those who do not. Deloitte refers to this phenomenon as the power of a leader's shadow. And they identify six signature traits of this kind of leadership, all of which are interrelated and mutually reinforcing. The first is commitment. Inclusive leaders are deeply committed to diversity and inclusion because it aligns with their personal values and they believe in, in, in diversity and inclusion for the business case. They articulate their commitment authentically, bravely, challenge the status quo and take personal responsibility for change. So it's one thing to say you value diversity and inclusion. It's sort of a tagline. It's another thing to have a true commitment. People can pick up on that. They can perceive that. The second is courage. Inclusive leaders are humble about their own capabilities and invite contributions by others. I have a lot of talented people on my team. I recruit talent. I want people on my team that smart, who are smarter than me. I want people on my team who have better ideas than me. I think that, that takes a lot of courage. That takes a lot of confidence. I think, you know, I've said before, my, my main job is to be the best listener of the group. Um, but you have to have that courage to be able to do that. Um, the third one is cognizance of bias. And this means that inclusive leaders are conscious of their own blind spots as well as flaws in the system. And they work hard to ensure opportunities for others. The fourth is curiosity, working on the college campus. That one is beautifully situated, um, having that open mindset, deeply curious about others, listening without judgment and seeking to understand. The fourth is culturally intelligent. Inclusive leaders are attentive to, the, to others' cultures and adaptives required. And last but not least, collaboration, empowering others to create conditions such as team cohesion and for diversity of thinking to flourish, you need that collaboration and that collaborative spirit. Collaborative spirit. So I guess the, the, the bottom line on this one is if you want to affect real sustained change in your organization, whether it be a large organization or a small one, you must focus on your culture. I think you have to change the culture. Um, if a diverse organization does not foster this culture of inclusion, it won't flourish, it won't thrive. And moreover, the talented people and the diverse people within your organization that you've invested uh, so many resources to recruit and hire will eventually leave and likely share their soured experiences with other people, and more specifically, other people who are members of their identity groups. So it's really important for uh, an organization to really embody and embrace and, and have the same values, and those are genuine values and a strong commitment because people 
we'll know if it is not. The other aspect of leadership, and I think this is after we are, I think 18 months, almost 18 months into the pandemic um, is um, crisis leadership. Um, and many of you may have already experienced that. I mean, we're approaching the 18 month of the pandemic in the US. And so I think many of us have heard the word unprecedented uh, used a lot since uh, January, 2020. The, the truth is that we have experienced a pandemic of this magnitude before. Um, but the challenge is not many people um, who live through that are around now. And so there's really no playbook because it doesn't happen that often. And so what I learned prior to the pandemic about crisis leadership, I was able to apply during the pandemic. I learned that there are two types of crises um, as a leader. Um, there's a routine crisis or emergency, and then there's a novel crisis, like a true crisis. And so in higher education, a routine crisis is something like, you know, we have facilities emergencies. Like today, we have a water main break in Oakland. And so one of our residence halls that has 600 students is without water for four to six hours. That's a crisis, it's an emergency, but we know how to fix it. Call the utility companies, they come out, we have a plan. Those are things that we're used to, unfortunate, but they happen and we have a playbook. There are student injuries, there are demonstrations and protests. And unfortunately, every now and then the death of a community member. Again, very traumatic things that happen, but we've seen them before. Um, we know exactly what to do typically when those things happen. In March, however, when universities were confronted with the reality of shutting down campuses, there, there was no instruction manual. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, what helped me lead more effectively during the pandemic was recognizing that we were in the middle of a true crisis, which meant we had no standard operations manual. So the first thing I did was tell my team that we were dealing with a true crisis. This is a novel crisis. And I explained the difference between the two. And this helped set new expectations, both for me and both for my, my team members. So basically what I said in establishing this is that I'm no longer the expert. So everyone's looking at me on a Zoom screen as if I have all of the answers. And I basically said, none of us have ever done anything like this before or made decisions in this environment. So I am no longer the expert. Um, there were very few answers that, that I could provide at the time. And so this allowed my team to rethink how we made decisions and how we problem solved. Um, I told the team that we were flattening the hierarchy uh, and moving away from the top down problem solving structure. I explained that at this point I needed diversity of thought and opinion and perspective. I needed folks to think critically and that would be how we were gonna be able to solve many of the things that we were seeing and experiencing for the first time. Everyone was responsible for improvisation and creativity. And I think that helped our team. Um, it helped them make sense of this new normal and cope. And one of the things that we talked about a lot at that time was grace, that we would make mistakes in this environment because we were figuring things out as we go. And so setting that culture as a leader and that sort of set resetting expectations, I think helped us thrive through some very difficult times and frustrating times. And so that would be one of the most recent lessons I've learned about leadership. Um, there will be times when you do not have all the answers and you need to rethink how your team is utilizing themselves and figure out how to collaborate on decision-making. I think a lot of that was happening around the country and around the world. I know a lot of that was happening um, at the United Way. So I wanna call to action. This is the last part of my, my remarks today. And there, there are four things that I wanna share with you um, that I found helpful to me that have been passed down to me and hopefully um, may resonate with you. The first is don't lose hope. The second is to use your privilege. The third is to take care of yourself. And the fourth is to lift as you climb. And I'll talk about each of these. So in terms of hope, each of us can do um, what we can to make a difference. Despite the despair and divisiveness in our country at times and the world, I, I encourage you, I encourage my students, I encourage my family to never lose hope. Um, I try to embrace the Stockdale principles. Admiral James Stockdale was held as a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. 
with other captives for seven years. He survived. But when asked which prisoners did not make it out, Stockdale said that many of them died of a broken heart. He said they were too optimistic. He said, you must never lose or confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. So in other words, when confronted by difficult circumstances, be honest about the reality you face, but find a rational basis for hope that you will prevail. So never lose hope. The second is use your privilege. Use your privilege to dismantle structures that are oppressive, barriers for historically marginalized groups and other folks. Now, as a cisgender heterosexual man, I have privilege in this country, in this world, even as a black man, simply by being born male and identifying as such, I was born into a social structure that affords me the privilege to not have to think about my gender identity in many situations, including the work environment. So for example, women are roughly four times as likely as men to say that they've been treated as if they were not competent because of their gender. 23% of employed women versus 6% of men. And women are about three times as likely as men to say that they've experienced repeated slights at work because of their gender. 16% of women versus 5% of men. So, so my charge to you in terms of using your privilege is if you witness mistreatment of others or injustices of any kind, be an active bystander and intervene. If you find yourself feeling defensive when someone talks about or acknowledges your privilege, ask yourself why you feel the way you do. Most of us have some type of privilege. Think about the things you never think about because you simply don't have to think about them. So for example, if you've never had to have the talk when your teenager begins driving, ask yourself why. If you don't know what the talk is, ask yourself why. If you often forget it's payday, ask yourself why. So if we acknowledge our privilege, we can personally affect change in our personal lives and collectively dismantle structures and behaviors that impede equity and equality for everyone. So I urge all of you, whatever privileges you have, use them to help and benefit others. Third, take care of yourself. The entire world is under a tremendous amount of stress. Self-care is important to maintaining your healthy relationships with yourself, including your mind, your body, and your soul. So make time to engage in activities that, that help you find your center, your balance. I try to walk at least three miles a day I learned to put my phone on do not disturb and disconnect from the digital world, except for my music. Walking helps me clear my head. It helps me think, I come up with new ideas, or I'm just content in my own thoughts. Sort of like I go back like 30, 40 years when there were times when you would just sit and you just listen to yourself think or listen to nothing at all. So if you're overwhelmed, talk to someone, schedule an appointment with a therapist or someone you can confide in unapologetically prioritize your well-being. Take care of yourself like your life depended on it. So take care of yourself. And then last but not least, lift as you climb. Life is a journey. All of us, as we continue along our journey, remember that we're privileged. Your time and talent are wasted and all of you are talented. Um, if, you don't use, if you don't use that talent to improve the world in which we live, um, one of the, the, thing, the things I've learned, at least in my own personal experiences, is that people will forget your name at times, but they always remember how you made them feel. So use the knowledge you've acquired, the skills you've developed, wherever you've developed them and acquired them, and the gifts you've inherited to do good, to inspire, and to help other people. None of us are here without the support or help of others, people who showed us they care, people who helped us feel like we matter or belong. So as you climb that mountain of success to achieve success, however you define it, remember how you traverse the seemingly insurmountable mountain and reach back to help others in the same way that you were helped. So lift as you climb. I tell students when I have an opportunity to talk to them when they graduate that I hope that in some meaningful way, 
Their time at Pitt has helped shape their understanding of themselves, other people, the world, and optimistically, their passion and purpose in life. Above their diploma and all the other credentials that we find before or after our names, I think the most significant value will be their commitment to making the world a better place and their deeds toward that noble end. So in closing, I wanna end with the words of the late Maya Angelou. She said this, she said, as you grow older, you will discover that you have two hands, one for helping yourself, the other for helping others. So I wanna thank you all for your time. I wish all of you good luck, prosperity, peace of mind, most importantly, and last but not least, may your spirit be in accord with your voice. Thanks, folks. Kenyon, that was so wonderful. I, I wonder if when I was a student, people gave me such wonderful advice and I was too young to ever pay attention, but I'm so glad to have had this opportunity to listen to your advice as an adult and hopefully retain it this time. I actually wrote everything down. So thank you for your time with us today. We have um, some of our Bridges Society members have questions. And so I'm going to kick it over to them to frame them up for you. So the first one is Brittany Smouse. Hey, thank you for your story. Um, so a couple of things, ironically, I'm also a first generation college student from my family and I attended w &J. Um, But my question for you is, what have your experiences been with the United Way and how did you initially get involved? Hi, Brittany, nice, nice to meet you. I, um, I initially got involved. So my first memory of the United Way was my father when I was a child, he, he was a social worker. I remember him going to a local United Way, he took me along with him and he was presenting something. I can't remember what he was presenting, but I remember the United Way logo. And I just thought to myself, this place must be important because my father's speaking. So that's my first memory. But sort of fast forward to my time at Pitt, I think my first sort of gateway into getting involved here was a meeting I had with Bob Nelkin, the former um, executive director, um, and Chancellor Pat Gallagher, who's the Chancellor of Pitt. And we were talking about ways that we could engage um, our students in United Way campaign or just in generally, generally the United Way. And I think it was Bob Nelkin and Pat who sort of encouraged me, particularly Bob, to get involved in the United Way and, and think about how I could have a, a greater impact. And so I started, I think, on the United for Children Committee and then uh, have been working with that committee um, and then the, the impact cabinet as co-chair. So I, I love my, 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 my service in the United Way. Um, Bobby has been a fantastic leader and I've really enjoyed um, the last, I guess it's been almost two years of her leadership uh, and the work that we're doing um, to really look at how we can improve the quality of life for, for everyone in the, in, in the region. So. That's how I started to get involved is just really trying to figure out how to engage more students. And then also um, more recently, formally with the impact cabinet uh, and United for Children. Okay, so I think Jessica Beakley will be next. Hi, Kenyon. Hey, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited to see that you were set up scheduled for this interaction because it has been about a million years, but I was a student worker in Kenyon's office when he first joined the University of Pittsburgh and um, I will share at that time he was a phenomenal leader and it's been great to catch up over the last half hour and to simply see how your leadership style has continued to grow and evolve but you have always been a caring leader and that's a testament to you and um, something that you shared with me when I was a student um, I was a writer for the Pitt News which was our student newspaper at that time and writing has always been a passion of mine and um, I too was looking forward to graduating because I, I needed to have some more income so writing was not necessarily the path <laughs> that I was going to 
follow for my career, but you encouraged me to ensure that because you knew writing was my passion, that I always found a way to involve it in my career and ensure that it was part of it. Um, and I'm pleased to say that I have always made sure to this day that that has been part of my approach. Um, I've heard a lot about your passions, of course, over the last half hour, um, but I'm curious if you had to pinpoint what your passion is um, and share with us how you have built that into your career, whether or not it's been necessarily a traditional part of your work, if you could share with us how you have done that. Yes, I, I, Jessica, it's great to see you. It's like a full grown adult now. Like it's like, it's, it, it, oh, it's just amazing. Um, I, yeah, and, and Jessica was a fabulous student and student employee in our office um, and an amazing writer. Like I laughed at her pieces. I thought they were incredibly funny and talented and she's a great writer. So, um, I, and I remember that conversation. Um, so my passion, my passion has been, I think I, I realized that like my passion was working with young people, not, so young people meaning college age. Um, and so I learned that when I was in college, because often my friends would come to me and talk to me about their problems and they thought I gave decent advice. I don't even want to know the type of advice I gave at 19, 20, but they thought it was good advice. But the reason I went into counseling is because I, I realized that like I probably needed to be responsible and figure out like the right way to talk to people and help people in that aspect. And so that's how I entered into the counseling realm. Um, but I knew I loved working with people and helping people. And um, college students just seemed to be like a great population to work with where they were mature enough to manage and live independently, but they were also in this transformative stage of their lives where um, they were open to seeing the world in various different perspectives and then taking what they've learned to go on and do great things with. And so that's always been my passion is, I guess, teaching and helping to provide opportunity and support to, to, to college students. And so Pitt has provided me that opportunity prior to Pitt. Kent, Kent State provided me that opportunity. And I, and I see myself continuing in higher education in any capacity where I'm able to work with students, whether it's at the faculty or administrative level. So my passion is working with college students and at the core college students are people. And I think it's a helping profession, uh, student affairs specifically. Now we're gonna move to Beth Bradley. Okay, hi Kenyon, thank you so much for your speech. I really enjoyed your words and was very inspired by your stories. Um, my question is what is the one piece of advice that you give to college students who are soon to graduate and enter the workforce? That's a great question because my son just graduated and we're trying to get him to enter the workforce. Um, <laughs> so he's at that point. Um, I, 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 maybe a few things. I, I think the first practical thing is, um, and I take this advice when I was like working on my doctorate and, you know, you get into that district, if any of you have sort of had this experience where you're writing a dissertation or a thesis, particularly a dis dissertation, there were some of my classmates who were trying to write, like get a Nobel prize on their dissertation or write like the best dissertation. And the advice I received from all of the faculty was just write the dissertation. Like you have your lifetime to like, create that masterpiece or win a Nobel Prize or Pulitzer, whatever you decide. Um, so how I translate to that to sort of recent graduates is that your first job is not necessarily your career. And I think it's very difficult to, to, to graduate from college and you have the expectation that your first, um, your first job will be like your career. Um, so that perspective I think is very helpful. Um, and that sort of spins into persevering and, and really not giving up because the job search can be difficult. You may not find a job immediately or you may fail at many attempts. And I so, so I think that the advice I've given folks, including my own son is to persevere and to hang in there and to be confident in the skills that you have, the abilities, the knowledge that you've acquired um, and don't sell yourself short when you go into these interviews. 
Uh, so there's a, a level of be confident in what you've learned in college. I think oftentimes college students will graduate and they may not really appreciate what they bring to the table, even for some of the positions that they're applying for. When I was uh, in residence life, I would do mock interviews with RAs and it, it was striking how many of them would describe their RA experience and they would basically say, they would summarize it into, well, I was an RA on the floor and I did programs and enforced policy and hard stop. And, and, and I would say, okay, let's reflect on that. That's, you did much more than that. So let's, let's figure out how to articulate that. So first perspective, your first job is not necessarily your career. Um, it can be sort of the beginning of building towards that part your career. Um, two, that perseverance and never giving up. And I think three is that confidence. And then the fourth is, and I think this is, um, you know, what, what Jessica talked about and what we discussed is always think about what brings you joy. Um, and I think that's been really helpful for me. Um, it has, you know, I think that's fundamentally one of the best ways to align your skills and your passion um, to, to a, a eventual career. So what brings you joy? And, and, and if you don't lose sight of that um, and keep that as a North Star, I think that that, that will lead you in a good direction. Um, and, and hopefully that advice has been helpful to folks who've graduated and I've been, been able to talk to. And that's the advice I've given my son who just graduated a few weeks ago. Congratulations, it's exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, our next question is from Kate Dawson. Kate. Hi, Kenyon. Uh, thank you so much. I have enjoyed your story tremendously. And I would like to ask you if you could provide the featured, uh, the rising leaders in our area with one piece of advice, what would it be? Wow, that's a one piece of advice, Kate. Um, if I had to prioritize a piece of advice, um, I would say, I would go back to some of the last things I talked about. I would say, use your privilege to truly make Pittsburgh the most livable city for everyone. We have, a, we have tremendous talent in this city, folks who are here, who have a lot to offer, but an understanding that, you know, Pittsburgh is a place that needs work and all of us have the ability, particularly our new professionals, young professionals to make a difference in, in the region. And so I would say, use your privilege to make Pittsburgh truly the most livable city and truly means for everyone. That would be my, my advice. Thank you very much, Kenyon. Um, Laura, will we, will, or have we finished with our question section or are there additional questions? I think the only other question that we would ask is how has the experience changed for students and, and educators at Pitt this year? You know, what changes have you seen with coming back to, to school after such a long absence? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, last year was really difficult for us uh, in, in higher education and Pitt was no exception to that. I mean, you know, I, we talked about, you know, why I got into this work is to work with students, it's that energy you feel. And last year, there was not much of that. It was a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, um, policy enforcement, um, and we didn't have a lot of people here. Um, this year is different. It's beginning very different. So, you know, we moved in almost 5,000 students um, this weekend um, over a period of a few days. And so the energy on our campus feels very different. People are back in the office. Oakland is thriving and it has that energy to it. Students are happy. And you can see like that sort of bright eye, like I'm in college, this is what I dreamed college would be experience like unfolding in front of you. And so I think it's just re-energized all of us who chose to work in higher education for that, um, to really come back and give this another shot this year. Now, this year is still a lot of, a lot of unpredictable um, aspects to it, but as much as we can um, 
create that environment that students, I think, need and long for, and that social connection and engagement with each other, um, provided that the public health situation doesn't deteriorate around us, um, and we're, we're all in for that. So I would say this year is very different. People are here, there's energy, people are engaging, um, and all of the things that you think about when you think about a residential campus like Pitt um, are happening right now. And I think that's brought a lot of hope and positive energy and joy to, to, to a lot of folks on our campus, um, along with still a little bit of the anxiety and uncertainty and fear. But, but I think this year is very different than last year. And our goal is to, is to do everything that we can to maintain it as best as possible in the most responsible way. Well, thank you so much for your words, Kenyon, um, for your insight and your wisdom. It's it's very interesting listening to you talk about the the energy on campus and reading a list of things that you're responsible for in your office. Um, and it's definitely giving me flashbacks to my time at Pitt. Um, so, but my name is Courtney Murphy. I am the I'm Laura's co-chair on the Bridges Society, and. I am so glad to see everyone here today and for the interest in participation um, and again for the inspiration that Kenyon was able to provide to us today um, and all of his thoughts on community and self and leadership. So, and that's actually something that the Bridges Society is very much about, um, helping young professionals build their leadership abilities, define themselves and belong in their community and help uplift their community. So um, that's something that we're, we're very excited to have so many young professionals interested in our program and the folks who are already members and involved. So those of you who, are, who already belong to the Bridges Society, thank you for your contributions in the past of your, your time, your interest, your treasure, your talent. Um, and we would very much like to ask you to go ahead and renew your membership um, and continue to work with us to, to build the next generation of leaders in the city of Pittsburgh and surrounding communities. Um, that's something that you can do either through your workplace campaign, uh, especially if that's something that you've done before. Um, and there's also options to make your gift as an individual. So that's something that is available. Um, if you're interested in working outside of your workplace campaign or your workplace does not have a current campaign. And for our guests who are joining us today and who are not yet Bridges members, we would love for you to consider joining us in our mission, uh, joining the United Way and helping move things forward. If you would like to learn more um, about Bridges as a potential member, as a prospective member, or even just as somebody who's a member but would like to know more about our program, um, please go ahead and contact our team. Um, the email address is bridges at unitedwayswpa.org. Um, and I've gone ahead and dropped that in the chat as well for anybody who would be interested in just reaching out to communicate with Lauren Mitchell or myself or Laura Miller. Um, we can provide you more information, stories, anything like that. So, and to that end, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my membership in Bridges um, and my work with United Way. Um, I've been working with United Way for about five years now in several different committees, um, groups, uh, and roles on, in, in those different organizations. Um, and it's something that I very much enjoy because I love seeing the impact that the United Way can have in bringing groups together in finding ways to solve problems. Uh, at the individual level and sort of the, the overarching convener level, the, this synergy that they're able to provide. Um, it's something that while I was involved in, in various philanthropy and charity as a child, it took just sort of the looking around and seeing the, the good things the United Way was doing combined with the, the solid place that I had found myself after a couple of rough years as a young professional and realizing that, hey, it's finally come time to give back. I'm in a position where I can start sharing the, the benefits um, and the security that I've earned and, and making that a reality for other folks as well. So that's something that it's, 
it's been very rewarding and also the connections that I've been able to make as a member of the Bridges Society and the Women's Leadership Group um, and just the United Way in general have been wonderful. It helped me learn about Pittsburgh in a whole new way, despite having been here, oh, more than half my life at this point, oh my goodness. So please consider joining us. Um, we do have a next gen kickoff event coming up at the end of September on the 28th. And for those of you who are Bridges members, we have an exclusive happy hour that is a kickoff to the kickoff. Um, we will have an hour happy hour prior to the event um, and then the networking and food packing event uh, that evening. So if you have questions or need additional information, please reach out. But um, we're all, and we're always here to answer and we do look forward to seeing you soon, whether in person, hopefully, or also um, on, on these continued video calls, should that be the way to most safely move forward. So thank you again for attending. Thank you again, Kenyon, for your time and your wisdom. And thank you everyone for your support day to day of the important work of the United Way. Have a good rest of your Tuesday and have a good rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.